Welcome to the 427th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome and thanks for listening. Today is going to be a race recap, recap. so if you hate race recaps, uh, turn it off now. I got a little bit of plant-based stuff in the end. Um, I got a little bit of motivation stuff to go along with it, so maybe hang in. Um, you might um, you might find some of it interesting. I was in Texas for the Brazos Bend 50-mile trail race, uh, second year that I've been there. I'm happy to report it's the second year I finished 50 miles, and I was over an hour faster this year, so um, that made me happy. My finish time was 12 hours and 9 minutes. This state park was uh, just outside of Houston, uh, about 45 minutes from our famous Eddie Delaney Meinrich's home in Pearland, Texas. Um, So we traveled up there to run the race, and um, it is a flat course, and most of it is kind of hard-packed dirt, small rocks, um, dirt trail, a little bit of paved trail, um, no actual road. There are a bunch of lakes with very large alligators, and so the pre-race instructions are don't walk in front of the alligator's head, don't walk between the alligator's head and the water because they're going to want to get away from you. They're pretty tame. You can walk around the back. Don't jump over the alligators. I had no desire to do any of those things, and I'm happy to report that I did not see an alligator that was not in the water. We saw plenty of in the water, but none out of the water. We did, however, see three snakes. Um, one, uh, the uh, I almost stepped on uh, coming out of an aid station. Uh, one was at the side of the trail that stuck its tongue out of my shoe. And another one, Addie tried not to mention to me as we ran by and she saw it. So that was our snake sighting. So no snake bites. Um, the race director said there's never been any snake bites or alligator bites, so I think that uh, this year was good for that. Um, not sure I want to camp in those areas, though, but um, nevertheless, you know, I'm just not an outside camper, I guess. We started at 6 a.m., thank goodness, because it was very hot and humid. I think it was seven, 70 degrees at the start, and so we had headlamps, and so you could hear the alligators groping, and you look over and you can see their eyes in the water, so they were there. There's some pretty birds there as well. So you run, you know, around lakes, through the woods, and the race starts by um, doing a little 5K out and back. You come back to the main area finish line where people set up their tents to have their own refreshments, as well as there's a, um, a, an aid station set up by the race uh, itself. And then you do three 16.7-mile loops, um, always finishing back um, at the finish line so you can get more things. Um, Being plant-based, aid stations aren't necessarily my friend um, as far as options go. And, you know, I I, I really, I I know we're, we're trying to get as far as nutrition, simple sugars, but I'd rather not have simple sugars full of added chemicals as well. Typical aid station food is Coca-Cola, orange soda, great or uh, ginger ale, um, varieties of candies, um, chocolate covered peanuts, maybe M&Ms, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, Oreos, Pringles. Um, when it starts to get cooler, they bring out Raymond noodles uh, and mashed potatoes. I'm not sure how they make them, so I stayed away from them. I wasn't sure that there'd be chicken broth, so uh, I didn't do any of that. So planned on having uh, our own food, so we used the aid station to get water and ice. This race is wonderful because they have these giant tubs of ice, plus they have buckets of ice that you can kind of cool off, and that's really a lifesaver when it's so hot to try to keep your temperature down. And I, and I have to say, the first loop, I was having a little bit of trouble keeping my heart rate down, I think because we are sweating so much and it was so humid. So I actually had to slow down more than I wanted to early on just because my heart rate was high because it was so hot. My legs felt good, but I didn't want to burn out. Uh, The higher your heart rate is, the more you shift to burning glucose. You can only carry uh, in your muscles about 2,000 calories of glucose, your liver 200 calories of glucose, and after that's gone, 
then you're going to have a forced slowdown until you can absorb some more from your GI tract. So the rate limiting step in long runs is being able to absorb calories and use them effectively. You can't really burn uh, fat for the most part, just a little bit in the background um, because you'd have to mo mobilize fat from your fat stores into your bloodstream, into your muscles. So that's a long route. Taking fat in requires a lot of metabolism. Uh, protein, uh, you might break down a little bit for glucose when the tank runs dry, but for the most part, you're not breaking, you, you don't need to take in protein for a race that is less than 24 hours in duration. So the idea is to get in sugar that you can absorb and tolerate that doesn't make you ill. Um, so I relied on liquid calories. Um, I used an electrolyte powder mix that has sugars in it. Um, it's called Gnarly, G, and I'll make a reference to it. I'm not sponsored by them. And there's one called Tailwind that I use. Um, I had some mango juice there. Um, I actually made some rice balls with rice and soy sauce. It didn't work out so well. It just seemed dry when I came through after 19 miles. Um, I did have some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches from the aid station quarters, so to speak. So um, I did use that. I had some Coca-Cola at the end of the race, um, probably the last 16 miles. I uh, At those four aid stations, I, I took, you know, about four or five ounces of Coca-Cola. And then gels that have um, chia seed in them called Huma. So it's a uh, fruit-flavored um, sugar-type mixtures with chia seeds. I also did some baby food pouches, so I did a beet berry chia seed pouch, I did an apple pear pouch, I did uh, a strawberry banana oat pouch, which was pretty good. Um, I tried a breakfast round, I just didn't think I absorbed it fast enough, so that didn't really, um, wasn't kind of worth the, to me, putting the calories in, because I didn't get any big bang for my buck early on, so... Um, what I had worked out, I was getting tired of those things by the end of the race. I didn't want any more gels after about mile 30 uh, or 40. Eh, maybe I got to 40, what took some gels. So I, the, the liquid calories, I tolerated good. Again, the Coca-Cola, I tolerated, you know, but it's just little amounts. Um, so I'll talk about that, you know, a, a little bit later. But um, the idea is to get in about... 250 calories, 200 to 250 calories an hour for somebody my size. So if you're going to look at 16.7 mile loops, I was aiming to get about 800 calories and carry 800 calories with me. So I made baggies and put 800 calories worth of a variety of those things in each baggie so I could come back to the tent after each loop and grab the baggie and go. Um, we did make some mashed potatoes and put it in a the thermos. Um, I didn't get any of those. Um, Michael ate those. Unfortunately, Michael's leg, his knee injury acted up, so he had to pull out at mile 19. Um, so, you know, I had to let him eat the potatoes. Actually, he didn't ask, but he ate the potatoes. And that's okay, because he had nothing else to eat. Well, I guess that's not true either because he had the rice balls and he had watermelon and he had a... <laughs> but anyway, he got to eat the mashed potatoes as a consolation prize. He said they were very good. Interesting, as a side note, if you've ever been to the grocery store looking for instant mashed potatoes, I hope you don't eat those on a regular basis. They're just potato starch, potato flakes that are dehydrated. You add water and you have instant mashed potatoes. Virtually every box on the shelf at the grocery store has some sort of milk, butter, cheese, bacon, some awful, god awful lard um, additive to them. We did man manage to have some here in Port Charlotte that were just the potatoes, so we actually brought them with us because in Texas there's, you know, there's 50 yards of instant potatoes at the large grocery store, but none without any kind of butter in them. So we made our own. Uh, in a thermos, so that worked out good, especially since we, you know, came back to the tent. Um, didn't have any Raymond noodles that we made this time. It was so hot, I really didn't want any hot food, and I managed to finish by um, around six o'clock. So um, it, the sun was just finally going down the last couple of miles. So I, I wasn't looking for anything on the warm side at all. As far as my heart rate goes, I actually hit into the 140s, and that's a heart rate that I'd be more likely to run 
a marathon in rather than a 50 mile in. So I knew I had to back, back down a little bit. Um, and the first three hours, my heart rate was, you know, in a 130 to 140 range. And I started out with a pace about 11 to 12 minute miles, which is much, um, usually I have a much lower heart rate for that slow of a pace. But, you know, I think the heat and the humidity, um, just really drove that up. The average moving pace for the race was three thirteen thirty, but um, you don't get to stop the clock when you stop. So my average pace for the whole race was fourteen uh, twenty four. I stopped thirty seven minutes and twenty three seconds to get food. There were nine aid station stops. It averaged about. Uh, four point four minutes and 16 seconds per aid station. So I didn't think that was bad. I basically stopped, got, filled my bottles with water, got ice, got a PB&J, um, and, and went on. So uh, two bathroom stops early on, but none until the end after that. So I was getting a little bit dehydrated despite taking about 28 ounces of uh, liquid in um, every four to five miles. Um, so, you know, it was borderlining on needing to have more fluid with me. Um, I had a third bottle. I actually started to carry it with me in the third loop. Um, I thought I could stick it in my race vest, but it wouldn't really fit easily and it was banging me in the head. So I, uh, ended up handing that off, um, at the first aid station. The surprise came when, uh, Addie Delaney Meinrich and her husband Nathan decided to show up and pace me for the last uh, loop. So I uh, met up with uh, my favorite strength coach, University of Houston strength coach, Nathan Meinrich, and he paced me for five miles, turned me over to Addie at an aid station where we saw our first snake, and um, we went on our merry way for eight more miles. So that was a lot of fun. Um, Having somebody to, you know, run with and talk to and, you know, kind of past the time. I was, I have to say that I was very happy not really having much in the way of leg discomfort. Um, you know, before I've said in races that I've heard from other people, which is pretty much true, you know, your legs hurt at 20, uh, at a, after a marathon, but they don't hurt all that much more after another marathon. Um, I pretty much came through the 20 mile, 25 mile mark without much leg discomfort at all. I was slowing down more because of the heat and calories, I believe, than I was leg fatigue. It wasn't until my calorie, um, calories intake started to fall off in the third loop that my legs started to, you know, become tight. And And I can't say that I was, I mean, they were, they weren't fresh legs, but, but I've still moving okay with my legs and it wasn't like anything really hurt to step or anything like that. My feet were good. I wore a different shoe this time. I wore the shoe called Innovate, I-N-O-V-8. Um, and it has kind of a thin tongue and it actually probably had it tied tight to my, uh, foot. My ankles probably swelled a little bit over the day. Um, and it kind of rubbed on my, top of my foot, a um, little bit of a blister, but more of a bruise on top of my foot, left greater than right. I don't know why. Um, so I had to kind of stop a couple times and play with my shoelaces to try to loosen them up enough that it wasn't rubbing on the top of my foot, but enough that my shoe wasn't going to rub someplace else. I wore my toe socks, so no real blisters on my toes, but a big blister underneath my big toenail on the right. So that toenail is going to say goodbye uh, over the next week or so. Uh, but really, the rest wasn't too bad uh, as far as that goes or, um, you know, any kind of injuries. So, uh, you know, again, started out 6 a.m., uh, got light about 45 minutes or so, and uh, got rid of the headlamp and then um, just, you know, continued to, to make the loops. It's funny when we do dietary histories with our members or other people, uh, nobody ever really remembers how many calories they took in. They, everybody always says they took in 1,200 calories or they don't hardly eat anything at all because you forget half the stuff. And so just keeping in that fashion when I tried to go back and calculate my own calories, um, it was difficult. And even though I had you know, the 800 out in the bag, 
Uh, there was one one Ziploc that I didn't eat the bar in. There was, you know, one Ziploc that I didn't have the powdered um, liquid nutrition in. So I think the first loop was pretty good. Uh, I think I got about uh, eight or 900 calories the first 19 miles. Um, and then I think the next one, I was pretty close to that. Um, I actually could have used more calories on that second loop. I got a little... Um, I, I think I got behind in calories a little bit. And then the third loop, like I said, um, they ran out of peanut butter and jelly. They had Nutella. It has dairy in it. I don't like it. Um, so I didn't have any more of that. So I was pretty much just my drink mix. The gels started not to taste too bad. But when I look back, um, I probably, I was pretty close uh, to 800 calories, the third loop, given the Coke. Um um, that I that I took in. The other thing I did this time that I've never done before is I used turmeric gummies, and they have a couple calories in them, uh, I think. Uh, but I ate probably four or five turmeric gummies, and I really do think that did help um, with the discomfort in my legs. You know, not having much in the way of of, of pain uh, there. So I'm a believer. You know, I. I um, actually was introduced to the gummies or I tried a gummy a member brought brought some in for me to try I'm kind of anti-gummy um, because I don't want gelatin but I'm also didn't want the extra calories usually and um, I don't know I just not real sure that in a gummy they actually get in there what they say they're going to get in um, but anyway I tried these gummies and you know and I didn't want to but I didn't want to take a capsule while I was running so I figured that, you know, these kind of tasted like apple pie and they didn't stick in my teeth. So it actually actually worked out pretty good. So uh, I'm a favor of turmeric gummies uh, with ginger in them. I think, they, I think they do work. You do have to watch the calories. And if you're a diabetic, there is some sugar in them. So, you know, it could, it could cause havoc if you're, if you're taking a, a lot of them. But, um, you know, looking back, I think that I should have made my own peanut butter and jelly sandwich or sun butter sandwich. Um, I think that would have been a good, good thing to do. Um, in the future, our next race is um, the Silver Rush 50 in Leadville, Colorado, and it's not a loop course, so you can have one drop bag at halfway point. So we're going to have to figure out what to put in that to have the calories that um, you know we want to have. And certainly, that course is going to be more technical because it starts at 10,000. Feet goes to 12,000 plus feet. So that's going to be uh, another challenge. So now the idea is to wrap up um, or to ramp up my training with the tire pull, with stairs, with more weight training. Uh, probably going to do the parking garage, parking garage and steps uh, to try to, to get um, some simulation of elevation um, up North Georgia, there's a, a state park we can go run in that's not that far away, uh, a little bit north of Atlanta. So uh, maybe get one trip out there because I do think that uh, I felt good at 50 miles. We have 14 miles for the next, I'm sorry, we have 14 hours to complete the Leadville race. Um, t this race took me 12 hours. So add in elevation um, and technical difficulties. Can I get through in 14? It's probably cutting it close, so i got to do some work to, to make sure that, that um, I can pull that off. And, you know, it's going to be a challenge. It really is. Um, that breathing out there is, is real, and when you're not used to it, um, you know, it can play with your head. Uh, so it's another thing to play with your head as you're, as you're, um, as you're running. So, you know, um, one thing that was nice, you know, why do I talk about races on a plant-based wellness podcast? I am talking about junk food, I guess, and some of it's plant-based. Um, that is a big um, area that I think needs to be improved in the ultra-running community is what they have on the aid, at the aid stations. I know in some of the races, people may have avocado, but, you know, I've talked before about there's bacon. I heard somebody talking about the indigestion they got running, and it's like, no wonder with what people eat, you know, between the oil and the chips and the, and the different kind of candies and bacon and all that kind of stuff, I would, would think it would play havoc with your stomach. You get tired of eating sweet stuff. Um, 
but I do think the baby food pouches were, were a good thing. So, and they slide down pretty good. So that may be something to look into. Um, also may look into the little containers of soy milk or almond milk to add on to things. Um, you know, some runners do, um, you know, some of the inshore and like type products. Um, but those are just a chemistry experiment with oils and things in them. So, um, you know, don't want any part of that. I don't want to have to compromise my health to do ultras. I had a discussion with my almost 90 year old mother, the diva, um, this week. And we were talking about, you know, future races and, um, it's funny now she'll ask me, is this just a marathon? Is it, you know, when I'm going someplace, is this just, just going to be a marathon? You don't bike or swim because I used to do Ironman, you know, so it's just a marathon, uh, or an Ironman. And now it's just 50 miles. And she said, I wonder, you know, maybe, maybe it's, you're putting your body through too much to do, or think about doing a hundred miles. And it was kind of funny because she was okay with the 50 miles now that I've done it, even though that seemed ludicrous a couple years ago. She was the first one to ask me after my first marathon, or do you think you have this out of your system? So the question would be, why can't I get this out of my system and be happy with running three or five miles? Why do I have to keep pushing myself to go further and further and to see what I can't can or try to push myself into the ultimate failure because I'm going to come up against that wall at some point? Um, most likely, uh, unless I'm smart enough to pull the plug before I hit the, hit the failure wall. But I, there are some studies, um, you know, uh, runners, you know, have both feet off the ground. That's the definition of running, but not very far off the ground. And so we think people are crazy if they are, you know, climbing mountains or, you know, like I would never climb Everest or want to do one of those things, you know, or where I could fall to my death or, you know, repel or those kind of things that to me, that's dangerous because I don't have a perception of control. Um, jumping out of an airplane is a no, no for me, uh, cause I don't have control ultimately whether that parachute's going to open and how I'm going to actually, you know, how things are going to end up. So I'm not a risk taker for my, with my life, um, uh, in my perceived, um, in my perception of what a race is, I think that, um, and there is some, there are some studies that look at, you know, once you have that adrenaline with rock climbing or jumping out of airplanes, that the rest of life is just a little too mundane and you have to have those things to kind of keep you going. People will say that about endurance events, a little bit different, but you have a push, um, a stress level that, um, afterwards, you know, nothing kind of matches it. So you have to do it again or a little bit more stress to kind of get, I don't know if I would call it a runner's high or experiencing the ultimate low um, and still coming back from it uh, is, is more of what it is. But I look at it as um, maybe a fear of being stagnant. Um, I think when things are flowing, they're good. I think when you're moving, you're good. Um, to date, there's not been much of a study that looked at too much exercise as being bad. So I think as long as you push yourself in ways that are, are safe um, and take into consideration your health and, um, you know, how your body feels and how you're recovering, I think it's, it's uh, a pretty safe thing to do. Some people say it stresses your body, um, and that stress word is is um, a very interesting concept. We know when people are stressed as caregivers, it takes a bigger toll on them than when they are caregivers um, out of uh, a place of empathy. Um, we know that excessive stress can lead to prolonged elevated adren uh, sympathetic tone and cortisol levels, which can be inflammatory. But we also know that after that's exertional stress, inflammatory markers come way down. So I, I think not all stress is alike. I think your response to stress is very important. And I also think learning to deal with stress is very important because it's not ever going to go away and we don't necessarily have control over what's going to stress us at any moment. Things happen. And that's one of the things that I like about the ultra marathon and training for it 
is that things happen and you have to troubleshoot and plan and put the pieces of the puzzle together, take in consideration weather, humidity, injuries, pace, um, heart rate, terrain. And to me, that's a stimulation of your mind, uh, which is a good thing. If we talked last week about Alzheimer's disease and keeping your mind active and engaged and um, metabolizing glucose uh, readily is a good thing. So um, when you think about endurance activities that way, I believe that, that it's a good thing. Um, that's my justification. You might think I'm crazy. Um, the other thing that I've noticed, and it's great about trail running, and, and running in general, it's the positivity of it. Um, you know, even when I was running road marathons, people are cheering for strangers and ringing cowbells for strangers. And the trail marathon is even more because people are waiting for people to finish and you know when we ran in to the finish line there were four little kids that ran in with us and they were so exciting of course my family was there ringing cowbells and everybody was cheering and um it's just positive and people you know around their different tents are are cheering and happy for everybody that finishes and we still uh, stayed around and watched the finish line and cheered people in um after after i was finished and so it's that connection to people in such a positive way that come from such diverse backgrounds. Nobody knew anybody else's story. Uh, nobody was complaining about their uh, lot in life. It was all about um, how do you deal with this particular stress at hand and make the most of it and push yourself to achieve something um, that you may not you're not really sure that you can. Uh, I don't think anybody that starts a, a, a long endurance run is entirely sure that they'll be able to finish. Things happen, you know, injuries happen, um, weather happens. So um, it's taking a risk, putting your, out of your comfort zone for sure. Um, looking, you know, we didn't even talk about navigation. This race didn't have that much in the way of navigation, but some races you really have to na- pay attention and navigate through the woods and not make a wrong turn. So I, I think for the most part, it's, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Um, we had three generations at the race, uh, my grandson, my daughter, uh, myself, and a lot of other people had several generations. There were definitely grandparents there. Um, there were little kids, big kids, um, young people, you know, um, lots of different support uh, people around. And that's really positive because I think, um, you know, that doesn't happen a lot of times. There, you know, there was, nobody was hanging on their cell phone or their iPad. Everybody was outside getting sun, um, you know, engaged in nature. So I think that was, a, you know, it's what makes it a very positive experience. Um, it's not crowded. There are people around, but you're not, you know, step to step with with the masses of people like you're on a regular marathon Um, everybody cheers for each other everybody's you know gives a positive remark as you go past somebody so i i think that's you know as far as humanity goes it's you, you can't get much better than a trail race i know there are a lot of other ways to exercise and um you know you certainly um people that work a very physical job uh may not have uh, the desire to do um, things like this. Um, you know, some people play tennis, some people play golf, other different things. But, you know, I, I just don't think there's the positivity um, like there is in a race. Certainly, you know, not the physical stress like there is in a, in a long endurance race. Um, you know, if you have any desire to look into some of these, ultrasignup.com, um, uh, is a place that you can go, um, but there's various different websites. If you just Google, you know, trail races uh, or running clubs in, in your particular community, um, you know, you don't need a whole lot of equipment. Um, you know, a pair of running shoes, pair of shorts, shirt, so forth. Um, so it's a pretty cheap sport uh, as far as that goes, other than travel, depending on when you travel, where you travel. The nice thing about trail runs, there tends to be a lot fairly close for people so um you know a lot of times people don't have to travel that far it's interesting when i first started running marathons sometimes city marathons are closed when it's um too hot outside they'll actually cancel the race i think they canceled chicago or pulled it off one year 
um, mainly because there's so many thousands of people, they can't adequately um, provide ice and care for, for that number of people. Um, triathlon are typically in the dead of summer, so they're typically hot. So, uh, you know, the staffs of triathlon are, are usually more prepared. But, you know, I kind of think heat's a good thing. Um, you know, we know that if, you, if your body has a temperature, you fight off a lot of um, bad things. Even cancer cells have been noted to go um, be destroyed, but not normal cells in heat, um, different varieties of heat therapy. Certainly sunlight is a source of vitamin D. So I, I think there's something to be, you know, um, I know I've had a, a member or so that doesn't go outside when it's over 80, which is, you know, 75% of the year, I guess, here in Florida. Um, you know, doesn't people say they don't like to sweat or they don't want to go outside or they're afraid of the sun. Um, you know, even when there's been some studies when people looked at skin cancers, basal and squamous cells, skin cancers, um, despite... Uh, perhaps prolonged sun exposure may be increasing those cancers in certain instances. Um, other cancers such as breast cancer, um, colon cancer tend to go down. Lymphomas tend to go down with increased sun exposure in different parts of the world. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, uh, a protective element to, to being out in the sun. I am a believer that nothing happens in a vacuum, so I think that um, you know, as far as sunlight and cancer causation, I believe there has to be another underlying factor, a genetic factor, uh, an immune factor, um, because we never see it in isolation. Certainly there's a nutrition factor, um, in environmental exposures factor. So, um, I, I, I just am not, um, too concerned without with being out into this in the sun or exposed to the elements for a prolonged period of time. I actually think it's 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 pretty good. We're a big proponent of exercise, movement, and mobility in our practice. So we teach plant based nutrition as well as mobility and movement and running. And as I've talked about on this podcast before, um, you know we've had several members uh, complete half marathons and, and whole marathons and Ironman races. And um, we prescribe exercise, um, you know, I don't know, um, big box medicine, big medical groups. Um, you know, we were all forced in, by insurance companies and the government to use electronic medical records. Um, and Medicare actually reimburses physicians for clicking the right box, saying that they've discussed or looked at certain body parts or asked certain questions or prescribe certain things such as diet and exercise. And so when I see a note uh, from a big box doctor, they often say, you know, um, advise a healthy diet and exercise. And what does that even mean? You know, um, most of the time the doctor doesn't do much exercise themselves, most likely. So they don't know what to prescribe. Um, I've heard people say, do whatever diet that works for you, but certainly that's not much in the way of direction. So if we have two areas, exercise and nutrition, which to me are the pillars of health, and we don't give them any time in a physician's office, um, to me that's malpractice. So that's one of the reasons why uh, you know we, we push and ask and prod and have wellness challenges for our members so that they move. We know that when you don't move, you lose muscle mass, you lose mitochondrial function, which is the root of most lifestyle diseases along with nutrition and environmental toxin exposure. So most offices don't talk about environmental toxins. Um, certainly people don't give exercise prescriptions or help people to obtain an exercise pattern or find a preference. And of course, we know how much nutrition information is, is lacking, uh, and it's, it's very confusing out there. You know, this evening going through Twitter, I saw a doctor, you know, suggesting that people uh, eat meat to reverse multiple sclerosis, and, you know, that's just ludicrous. Um, you know, it, um, it, it's, it's just beyond me uh, when there are no studies looking at, um, you know, carnivore diets and long-term health. We do know that 
Blue zone people eat predominantly plant-based. We do know that red meat uh, is associated with increased risk of cancer. Uh, processed meats uh, all over the place. We do know that excess sodium leads to hypertension in the processed meats. So um, it, it's just beyond me that, that again, we we ignore nutrition so much and just, just prescribe pills. Um, we're very interested in getting people off the pills that all have side effects, if at all possible. I was surprised how quickly I recovered. Um, since I've been plant-based after a regular marathon, I can pretty much run the next day or the second day. I usually take a couple days off just for a little bit increased sleep. Um, I was pretty sore the next day after the the 50 miler, but it is now Thursday, uh, and I I started I did a little walk. Uh, I did running uh, as well as walking. I've walked every day this week uh, with Sophie. Um, so I did a little, we did a little bit of running yesterday, and I'll start running again tomorrow. I uh, will gradually increase my volume up just to get my legs a little bit time to, again, get the glycogen stores back where they should be, get the micro tears back where they should be, get my mobility back where it should be. Um, but I was very, very happy with uh, the recovery. Had watermelon, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables, really been pushing fruits and vegetable, or a lot of fruit this week. Um, and feel, feel really good. I know a lot of people don't think that they can do things or they'll never get to their ideal body weight or they'll never be able to run because they have knee problems. But, um, you know, I like to see people see, you know, turn it around and, and, and not what's impossible, but let's see what's possible. And, uh, you know, again, um, you know, what can you do? Um, again, we look at, technique and I talk about technique and I try to improve my technique. Um, we're all a work in progress. We have to start where we are and, and build up gradually. And, um, you know, I think anybody can run as documented by one of our members that's 87, that's running strong, you know? Um, so I don't think you're, you're ever too old to take up running. I don't think you're ever too old to give up on your health. Um, it's just the story that you tell yourself. And, um, you know, again, one of the things that come out of ultra, ultra endurance events is that you have to keep positive. You have to do positive self-talk. Um, and you have to realize that there are highs and lows and things ultimately come around. And I think that's a great prescription for life. You know, not every day is a good nutrition day. Um, but if you can make today better than yesterday and, um, you know, keep yourself accountable and increase your, look to increase your consistency over time. I, I think you can achieve about any goal that you, you want to achieve. So don't let people say you can't because you can, um, you know, turn things around to a positive. You can achieve a normal body mass index. I think that it's more difficult for some people uh, that have yo-yo dieted and done a lot of fad diets over their life. But I think with the right combination of diet and exercise, um, you can achieve a normal body weight and get your mitochondria back functioning and, and make yourself healthy again. So um, it's not all about one thing. It's um, multifactorial, and uh, you just got to keep pushing and keep trying new things. If you'd like to learn more about our practice, email me at, uh, you can go over to the website, drdelaney.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y. I'm thinking about having a question and answer live uh, podcast um, in the somewhat near future when I get things fix, uh, figured out, so that might be a fun thing to do. Um, you can email me at jamie at Dr. Delaney uh, with questions. Again, we'd like to have you be a part of our practice um, or, or join us. We do a coaching only type uh, situation for people out of town um, that are interested that I talk to people once a month and Addie talks to people once a month. We have a large members only website and a community um, and we'd like to grow that community. So if you'd like to be part of a very positive exercise and nutrition driven practice um, and get off medications uh, we're, we're where you should look so uh, we walk the walk talk the talk and are willing to give you our best shot so thanks for listening talk to you next week